But this one is an absolute brute. So this is Salvia Mexicana, and it has forced its way through the roof of our greenhouse. <laughs> the prettiest tree I have in the garden and the most bulletproof is Filaria latifolia. It's a tree that grows quite slowly. It has very pretty silvery bark and, and it, it sort of tidies itself up as it grows. It's grown in Japan outside temples because it tends to cloud prune itself. So the older it becomes, the more beautiful and cloud-like the shape becomes. Hey! Hello and welcome to episode 71 of Talking Dirty, our final edition before Christmas. We have over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, so, I was going to say so Christmassy, but you've just gone for blue. Where's your <laughs> festive spirit? Our Still, regardless, nevertheless, handsome, happy horticulturalist, Alan Edward Herbert Gray. <laughs> and over in Cambridgeshire, with a very Christmassy feel, I have to say that it's the most tasteful Christmas tree I've ever seen. It doesn't have a scrap of tinsel on it. Don't you dare tell me it does. We have thought as Maria Sophia Fredrickson. <laughs> well, we have a deal in our household. Uh, the other half won't let me put tinsel on the tree. So hey! every picture and piece of furniture has a piece of tinsel on it, I think. Oh, I see. That's the, You've the got balance. your own way in the end. <laughs> we are so happy that for our final episode before Christmas, we were able to welcome back our original Get Gardening co-conspirator, a return visit to the podcast long overdue, Ian Scott Roof. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Very well. Thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here. I feel honoured I'm in such a line of esteemed guests <laughs> <laughs> but you I mean I don't want to make anyone feel bad but you're our favorite thank you no it's nice to be here I'm an avid listener I, I listen to the audio version every week when I'm gardening and if I get a chance I do the uh, the visual form as well and it's I do love it I mean I see you two quite well I don't see you as much but I see Alan quite a bit and it's uh, but it's always nice it's always nice to hear and listen to what you're nattering about what have you been up to then Mr Roof well since I last saw you lots of gardening uh, lots of winter clearing, lots of leaf clearing, lots of pruning, trip to Edinburgh uh, to have a look around and see what's going on. A few nice art galleries, not garden related, but I'm always drawn to the, uh, the great masters, like the great Dutch masters. There's wonderful paintings of the mixed flowers, completely horticulturally inaccurate because you have so many things in flower, but I'm always drawn to them. I think it's anything botanical. Um, so that's really nice. I've been looking at a lot of art recently. I've been round my various mum and dad's garden, picking bits for show and tell. Uh, got a few tooly bits together as well, because a few tools I think might be really good Christmas presents and some lovely secondhand reused and reused books as well. But yeah, just been gardening, really. This is going to be going out with just enough time for people to lay their hands on a few last minute gardening gifts. So if you are lacking a bit of inspiration, hopefully this podcast will provide you with some. If um if you want to go back and watch the equivalent podcast we did with you last year, Ian, there were so many great gift ideas from um, vouchers, sort of season tickets to get to gardens or tins full of seeds, all kinds of lovely things. Uh, we'll try and, and link to that. Those tiny brushes. Al and I bought these yes. brushes thinking they'd be great for sweeping the pot and benches. It's about, a useful, <laughs> you could use it to sweep your laptop, but that's about it. Do you remember? We both got stung on that one. Hang Are on, you going to get yours? Has he got it? <laughs> Didn't we? <laughs> You did the same thing last year. It's like, we both got these brushes. They'll be great this for cleaning it. our benches. This is it. Can you see it? They're <laughs> lovely, aren't they? I mean, they're gorgeous. Tiny. They're lovely things, but I mean, they really are for, more for keyboards than, than for actually sweeping the parking <laughs> bench, I think. <laughs> and I thought they were amazingly good value for money, so I bought five. <laughs> they were good value because they were minuscule. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, one of the perils of buying on the internet, though, yeah, isn't it? True. No, it, it, it's if I could, if I, if I'd been in a shop and I'd seen it, I would have known. And I know now I, where I now know where they are sold in Marylebone Lane in London. There's a, a hardware store, and they do the most amazing brushes. Um, you know, half brushes and things you didn't know you couldn't dust brushes. Um, <laughs> fantastic range of brushes. So I shall go there the next time I want some decent brushes. I don't blame you. <laughs> Buy them a, in person. A prime example of buying off the internet is a friend of mine brought a, a crockery set off the internet, thought it was amazing value, and it was because it's for a doll's house. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> doll's house stuff could be quite expensive, so you can well, see how you'd get... But I mean, you could literally get a, two drops of tea in the pot. It was, I mean, they were so pleased, and they were like... <laughs> anyway. 
Well, I can tell already that we're probably going to get waylaid with lots of asides and lots of chat. And I don't want to. Uh, no, no, no. Of course, of course. I, I want to make sure we fit all your show and tell in because you always bring such a lovely array of plants. So let's dive straight into the plants you've brought along. OK, I brought uh, an interesting selection with me. Al will know this one. This is a lovely, huge eryngium, uh, but this is eryngium eburnium. Um, and it's got wonderful uh, seed heads on. There's a, there's a great form of this uh, of type of eryngium called um, Chelsea Physic or Physic Purple, which grows in the long border at Great Dixter. But this eburnium is a, a rogue sort of seedling cross, which I got from actually a plant heritage plant sale, which is great because you get lots of bargains from there. This is a small bit of the, of the flower and it's flowering at 11 feet at the moment, which is absolutely brilliant. And it's been flowering all summer and I know these are the old seeds that are finished, but it's just looking amazing. I mean, look at that for that sort of umble like flowers. It's like that sculpture that Al's got at East Ruston of the umbles, but it's just got much wonderful structure to it. So it's flowering at 11 feet. It's in an open, sunny situation. It's got that tussock of spiny foliage at the bottom. And then about five or six of these huge, great flower spikes at about 11 feet. And it's brilliant. If anybody can find it either at plant sales or seed, or if you can get um, the pandanifolium physic purple form from Dixter, then I strongly advise you to grow it because its actual footprint is really small. It takes up about 60 centimetres of border space, but height wise, 11 feet, it's looking absolutely spectacular. So I've only taken a bit off it, but I'm hoping that it's going to look absolutely wonderful if we get really good frost on it and things. That's at mum and dad's at the moment, but it's looking great. So Ian, uh, yes, Al. Could you, set, could you hang that upside down in a nice airy place and let the seeds drop? Yeah. Do you, do you want a load of it? Yes, please. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll bring you this and you can hang it in every place or in a bag or something. And yep. I think it'd come really well from seed, actually. I, I, know, I know they do. Yeah. Graham had it in the desert. Ah. Because, because it self-sowed in the desert, he got very cross with it and yeah. asked me to dig it out, which I did. He edited heavily. Hmm. Yeah. But this <laughs> is great. I'll bring, I'll bring you some of this because that is absolutely fantastic. So a great architectural focal plant to grow. Um, I've picked some fruits as well. Um, oh, I will cool. also know this one. This is a lovely head of Cornus capitata. I got some um, young plants you were selling about ooh, 10 years ago on the plant stall. And I got one to put in at mum and dad's 10 years ago. And look at it. It's looking <laughs> absolutely fantastic. It was a, a small thing, about two or three feet. And it's in the garden in Sal House, about sort of ooh, 10 feet in height and spread. And what I've done is I've thinned its legs out a little bit to sort of give it a more sort of vase like shape so you can get other things under it and it's looking absolutely fantastic and the birds started to eat it yet yeah they have slightly but this branch was right at the back and it's still got these lovely fruits on they um, are fantastic aren't can you they? just describe the fruits they're really spectacular well i suppose yeah they're a bit odd really. they remind me if you look at them like that like a flyer gar stool when you look at them they've sort of got this funny head with these sort of dimples on but al how would you describe it i think they look like lychees Ah, yeah. yes, that's actually a much better analogy. Yeah, and they're wonderful. And the flowers, when they come out, have those cornice like flowers, which are those sort of white bracts. But these, for me, tend to be a sort of slightly limey, sort of lime-like colour, you know, like you get on a stage light, you know, and that hydrangea as well. But they're absolutely beautiful. But I do love them for these fruits. They're fantastic. And I think to still have a, a half-decent crop of these on, when we're, we are now sort of in December. I think it's absolutely mm. wonderful. Although it's going to be a big tree, because you've got them down your um, sort of woodland path, haven't you, Al? Yeah. They do get big. Yeah. They're not uh, um, imposing, are they? They don't sort of dominate. No, no, they don't. There's one, there's a self-sown seedling behind the laundry room, um, behind that conifer, in, right in the back there. I don't know whether you've ever seen it. I don't know whether it's fruited yet, but, I mean, it's been there, I should think, eight to ten years. But mm. as a seedling, I don't know whether it's fruited yet. No, they're nice things. I, I just think they're absolutely lovely. I mean, a lot of the corners produce fruits, but I think corners capitata seems to produce the best and seems to manage to hold on to them the longest. So I think that's lovely. And I was thinking, actually, I don't know whether that would work as an arrangement, some sort of arrangement for Christmas. You could have it in the house. I don't know. The leaves might go a little bit, but you could clean it up and just have those fruits to nestle in amongst some seasonal foliage. It looks it does quite well in water if you take the leaves off. Yeah, so I think that'd be a lovely thing. So look mm. out for that, corners capitata. And I think as well, you know, I've mentioned a couple of things that are big, but it shouldn't put you off using them if you've got a small garden. I think we discussed this more, you know, but if you've got a room, have a couple of good big bits of furniture in it. I'll always say that. Don't put a little chair in, put a big chair in. I think it's the same in the garden. If you've got a small footprint, 
doesn't mean you can't go up. I'm a big fan of going up with plants and things and using that vertical space. So that's fantastic. No fancy soil. What did Beth Chatto always say? She always said, you don't have to just paint the garden, you can also paint the sky. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's a brilliant thing to say. It really, really is. And um, that cornice had really quite vibrant leaves for this time of year. They were quite... Yeah, it's, it's lovely, actually. They've sort of got this sort of um, almost slight sheen to them, a little bit like you find on some of the deciduous Eliagnus as well. So I think that's, that's quite lovely. I'm a big, big, big fan of this. I think it's a, it's a lovely plant and it's well worth growing. It's not fussy and it's very reliable. Um, I've got a couple of uh, camellias. I don't know if anyone's talked about camellia sasanquas recently. No. I know Al's a big fan of these, but I've got a couple of camellia sasanquas. Uh, I've got one which has just finished flowering there, but it's got some new buds coming on it. Uh, and that's um, one called Narumigata, um, which has sort of got these lovely pink uh, buds. Look like apple blossom. Yeah, they do actually. Yeah, these lovely pink buds that open up to sort of soft white flowers. And this was smelling lovely until I got knocked it. But it has <laughs> still got its lovely boss of anthers in the middle. The thing about Sasanquas is, is they start flowering late September, early October, uh, November. And um, I know that, Al, you've still got some that flower in December yeah. as well, like these ones, haven't you? Which yeah, I have. Yeah. Good sunny spot. They like to be baked, don't they, really? I've Unlike got, other communities. I've got a couple that have got double anemone-scented pink flowered one, um, which is on the path round the back of the, past where the dustbins are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone's got. Yeah. And another one on the um, east facing wall of the front courtyard. And both of those are flowering at the moment, but they are doubles. They are a little bit more. A bit blousy. Yeah, no, they're not actually. They're yeah. quite small flowers, but they are doubles. Doubles. I suppose this one, I suppose this, this one here is called Snow Flurries. That's lovely. Um, and I actually got hey, that hey. from a local, a local cash and carry, which you'll know about up on the ring road for not a bad price at all. But it's, it's really delicate. And, the best thing about these as well is the fragrance. The scent from them is lovely. I think a few stems of these in a, uh, a little sort of old ink, ink well or something uh, would be absolutely lovely. So I've got these in containers in uh, mum and dad's garden because the soil's not quite right. Although the Sasanquas will take slightly more alkaline soils. They're not so fussy about their pH. But snow flowers is lovely. And I think actually it would lend itself quite well because the growth is quite sort of scanned and slightly lax. It would lend itself well to being wall trained. I think a lot of them really benefit from that. And I think that reflected heat from the wall also will sort of help ripen the wood. Um, but yeah, Camellia Sasanqua is lovely for this time of year for flowers and for fragrance. And of course, they've got that lovely Camellia foliage, which is, is so, so nice, you know, which you always say it bounces, I always say it bounces light, don't you? It's sort of quite, it's glossy yeah. and reflecting and, which is absolutely lovely. So they're, they're particularly good. Um, if left to grow in the ground, this Narimagata would get to about sort of 12 feet probably, but it's a bit restricted in a pot, which is nice. Do they transplant particularly well, camellias? Because I, um, I think I'd like to pinch one from my parents' garden that was originally mine and I put in there and I'd quite like to move across. I've moved them well, haven't you? I've, I've moved some this week. Yes, no, they've, they've got a very, very fibrous root system. I mean, you, we can see that when we grow ours in pots and we grow them in pots or containers for the first, I don't know, five to 10 years, maybe to see, to see how, you know, depending on how well they grow. But they eventually get to be um, slightly pot bound so they don't perform quite so well. And then we put them in the garden. But you can see that when you take them out of the container, the root ball is absolutely dense. I mean, it's a very, very fibrous root. Mm. I think the most important thing is when you're moving them is to stake them once you've moved them, stop the wind rock. That's really important. And also to make sure you water them through the winter. I've just moved some for some clients at about sort of four or five feet. Got great root balls out with them and moved them and staked them. And I said, you've got to make sure you water them. She went, oh, I think Dame Nature will do that. I'm like, I don't think Dame Nature will as much as you think she will, because they just take up so much water. You know, once they've been moved, they are very, very thirsty. And you have to remember with evergreens, and I think this is something I've said before, is that when we get a frost, the water around their root balls is locked up. It's ice. But actually the plant itself, because it's got foliage on it, is still transpiring at a rate of knots. And for established plants, that's OK. But for something you've moved, that can be the downfall of it if it's not got that water around its roots that can take up freely. That's the issue, isn't it? Ian, you know what? If her plant dies, it won't be her fault. It'll be yours. <laughs> yeah, I, unfortunately, it will. I know. But <laughs> I did tell her all this. Um, I've brought a couple of coronillas. Oh, uh, um, yeah. I don't know if anyone's talked about coronillas recently. No. Um, but I've got Coronilla uh, valentia citrina glauca. So I've got that glaucous leaf is the glauca bit. 
uh, and the citrine a bit is obviously because the flowers on there, as you can see, are that lovely soft lemon yellow, really beautifully scented, those sort of pale lemon coronets. And I've got these as freestanding plants in the garden, which I've got a couple of canes in really, but I know that various gardeners uh, grow them as wall trained shrubs. They tie them into wires, put them up trellises. Um, Janet Sleep, who's a gardening friend of mine, she's got hers growing in a huge chimney pot because it actually roots down really deep into the ground underneath as well. And then the plant just sort of spills out over the top and it's lovely. In terms of sort of ultimate height of these, I'm not completely sure because I've seen them on walls sort of trained up to six feet and as freestanding shrubs at three or four feet. I think the main criteria is keep them out of cold, drying winds. They don't like that. They like to be quite sort of warm again really so a south or west facing wall is lovely for them um, and the flowering period for these citrina I think is probably slightly shorter than this one I've got here to talk about in a minute but the citrina probably sort of maybe three or four months would you think I'll sort of through the, the oh yes period. I mean I think quite that I mean ours has been flowering you don't notice it when it starts to flower in late summer because there's so much else that you know is blooming in the garden but you know, gradually as everything else and the leaves drop on other plants, you notice it. Now, I've, I've got one just outside the orange tree, which is growing through a honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. And the honeysuckle is actually doing my coronilla a great favour because it's something to hoist it up into. Because yeah. it is, you say, as you it's say, scandal, it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, very scandal. Um, and I sort of, you know, if I see a piece that's flopping out the side, I, when I'm going past, just push it through some honeysuckle and up she goes. And, and she's actually now about eight feet tall. Ah, so that's doing, yeah, really good. But the fragrance is nice, and it? it's delicate fragrance. Lovely. Um, but but it's, really it's quite, nice. It's quite something, if you go past it on a very cold day, and you suddenly catch a whiff of that fragrance, I mean, it's like a sharp tang, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's a lovely thing. I noticed that um, Cotswold Garden Flowers do quite a few different cultivars of these, and it seems to be that Bob, who runs the place, is selecting his own cultivars out. Now, it'd be interesting to grow a few and actually see how much yeah, they I, vary, I, I, but, you know... I haven't investigated those and I should do, but I mean, I've just, I've really discounted them as being that sort of hard orangey yellow, but I don't know whether they are or not. No, well, I've got the hard orangey yellow here and I don't know if I like that quite as much, to be honest. It's that sort well, that's of... Not, oh, that's quite a nice acidic. It's acidic got that sort of rich, yellow. rich yellow. But there's, one of these is in my, uh, one of my client's garden in, in, in Thorpe, Sheila's garden, and it's been flowering for nine months, this one. Now, it's in, so it, she's actually grown it up a small metal welded obelisk about sort of three feet and it's actually a really good way to grow it because it's not tied in as such it's just sort of using like like Alan's is using that honeysuckle this is using that sort of metal obelisk for support and it's gone up this three feet and it's splayed out and it's been flowering for nine months which mm. I didn't think these actually did but if you look at that I mean that is quite a nice yellow actually when you close it did. yeah there's a lot of lime green in the bottom of those flowers that's lovely yeah, that's true, actually. So this is just Coronilla um, Valentia Glauca because of the foliage, and it's not got those citrine-coloured flowers. But I think I'm definitely going to invest in more of these. And there's some variegated leaved forms as well. And I think there's one called Brown Strain, which is one from Bob. So I'd be interesting to see how they do and how they vary. But I think because our climate's changing and we are getting those longer autumns, as Alan always says, and we're getting those milder winters, these are perfor performing much, much better. It's a lovely mm. thing. I think thought is in your soil, maybe a large container would be good because I think yeah. you're quite heavy, aren't you? And I think they do really want something quite sort of gritty and free draining. Yeah, I'm sitting things. here thinking about where I would put it, but I think um, I think it would need some help. But they're yeah. so cheerful, just they're good, so aren't they? bright and lovely, and particularly now at this time of year, that lovely little pop. And of course, we always this time of year as well. I think we're drawn to scent more, and we're drawn to those things which just perform more, aren't we? And I think as gardeners as well, we learn to limit ourselves during the winter, don't we? And we start to appreciate things that in the summer might just be the background plants, might be the supporting cast. But actually, when a lot of other showy stuff has gone, when the show stars have gone in for the winter, the supporting cast tend to come forward a bit. I think, do you know what I mean? They tend to do their thing, don't they? I was just thinking, it might be rather nice if you somebody's planting coronilla today to actually consider putting unguicularis iris underneath the little Algerian winter flowering iris. Yeah, that's a beautiful. Because they, they, they would then sort of flower in tandem and you have either white or various shades of mauve, depending on the variety that you can get. But iris unguicularis, it's a bit of a scruffy thing, I suppose. But I think if you give it a, give it a light trim, probably in August before the, it starts producing flowers, um, I think, you know, and then it produces these lovely little silvery buds. 
And if you pull them very gently out of, the, out of the middle of the stem, and if you bring them indoors into a warm room, you can watch them slowly open in little jerks. Lovely, isn't it? And there's a couple yeah, of there's some good named cultivars, isn't there, Ron? Yes, there are. There's, there's quite a few, actually. Peloponnese snow, is it one that you've got? I've got Peloponnese snow, which is a white one, which our gardening friend Rosie always tells me is a, is a floppy thing, but I don't think it's too bad. Is it Mary but, Barnard as well? She's quite yeah, a good one. Yeah, Mary Barnard's a good one. Um, I'll tell you where you can get them from, and that's um, Broadley Gardens, Lady Christine Skelmsdale. Um, and the great thing about buying from people like her is the fact that she's dividing her plants that she's got the whole time. I mean, she grows them specifically for selling, but you get divisions. Nice. Um, and so, you you know, and occasionally she has some for sale that you are not generally for sale. They're very slow. Um, and one year you might suddenly get a very unusual form of Iris unguicularis because she's got it and she's selling it. I think that's lovely. I remember I remember Vita Sackville West in her books talking about picking flowers and having them in little little glass vases at Christmas and things. And I always remember our friend our friend Richard, you, Alan says about cutting them back. And I always remember Richard saying, of course, in the wild, he said, they are grazed back ferociously by mountain goats. And I always remember that that's, that's, you know, that's always where I remember to shear them all back. And so many gardeners don't. And whatever happens when you do shear them back, you'll always get that little cluster of sort of tufty brown stalks in the bottom. But what you will get as well is you'll get to see the flowers rather than being in tatty foliage. And you've got to go through with a pair of scissors thinning out all those leaves in amongst the in amongst the buds so i think that's a great idea to do it early it really is um i've got a i've got a fuchsia still flowering mm. i've got um fuchsia uh, bacillaris that i got from uh witten from richard a couple of years ago now and it's one of the well i think we know lottie hobby is one of the most popular ones but it's part of that group called the echiandra fuchsias which all have and the microfillers that all have these tiny tiny leaves and then these wonderful pink uh, and Alan's got one, which I think you've got one, which is salmon, haven't you? Which flowers yes. quite nicely. Yep. And you get sort of these almost slightly reds coming through as well. But they're just lovely. Hardy. That's so pink. Isn't it lovely? Wow. I mean, really airy foliage as well. Uh, good cutting material, even on here for December, which is, which is great. Flowering at about sort of two and a half feet. And it's been flowering since June. And it's still going strong, which is lovely. And we have had frosts here. We've had some quite good frosts here I'm in South Walsham and it hasn't seemed to have stopped in it's looking lovely but I thought how lovely to get one of those little echiandra or microfilla fuchsias to be flowering now and I think quite a nice thing that if you've got a conservatory or an orangery or something you could bring a few in and have them in pots on display through the coldest months so really lovely. A couple of years ago on our snowdrop day we had the red version of that coralie red version of that just just outside um, near the Wellingtonia and P P I mean Richard was Trans transported to heaven, I think, because you couldn't believe that in, in February this thing was covered in flour. Yeah. And, um, you know, several of the nurserymen and, and various other visitors that day, I mean, they really did make a fuss of it. They thought it was wonderful. And did you buy that as a named cultivar? Was it like a rogue seedling or it was misnamed? Or did you buy that specifically because it was well, that salmon? Because it's quite an unusual colour. It is, but truthfully, I can't remember where it came from. No. It may have been like a rogue plant that got just of a batch, be. maybe, because you find yeah. that, don't you? You find that. It was funny that day, though, because I went straight from that plant to Richard Hobbs and said, have you got anything similar? And I think that was the day I ended up buying Lottie Hobby from him. <laughs> <laughs> I've brought a bamboo in with me, which you can't do it justice there. But this bamboo, I think I must grow this. This is Borinda papyrifera, uh, a, one, a wonderful thing. I don't think anyone ever really talks about bamboos, unless the frustrated gardener did last time. So I know that he's fantastic with his exotics. But it's really doing its thing. I got it from a friend of mine, Andrew Mott, who was known as the Bamboo King. And he had this wonderful garden in, in Norwich, which was just, you knew it. It was, it was um, on the edge of the sort of Golden Triangle, but it's a small little terraced house. But you knew it because it was near the doctor's surgery. But it was full. It was packed full. Everything shot up to 15 feet, including like the bamboos, the exotics, the acacia deal barters and all these things. But so I got it off him years ago and it grows by mum and dad's greenhouse. And it's absolutely lovely. I don't think... It's going to do it justice on here. But what it's got, and it's really showing its thing at the moment, is it's got this wonderful bloom, this wonderful sort of glaucusy blue bloom on those stems there, which is absolutely gorgeous. And its branch structure is absolutely lovely. You can see it's really open and loose and feathery. And this has been in 10 years. It's shot up to about sort of oh, 9, 11 feet. But once again, its footprint is only two feet across which is wonderful. I think plants which do that are great, which keep a small, because if you've got a small garden like me, you want to, you know, 
make as much use of the ground space you've got as possible. So I put it in really close, but you might be able to see this wonderful sort of blue, blue. My hands have taken it off. It's lovely. Al, you must have Berinda's somewhere, maybe up in the wood or something. I think we probably have, but I, I, I can't say that I know, whether I know I've got Berin, Berinda papifera, but um, on, it's on the wish list. It's, it's a lovely thing. And what, what, I, what, I tend, what I do with this every so often is I tend to, with bamboos, it's a great thing to lift its skirt. So to take off a lot of those little side branches up to say about a metre, so you get that wonderful effect of those stems at the bottom. Then it has a wonderful crown at the top. I know people get scared of bamboos. I, I know they do. People are like, oh, no, I can't, you know, they just assume it's going to take over the whole garden. But there are some good selections. Berinda's, for me, clump forming as well uh, and really good. And, and have a look, have a look through various websites. Have a look at Bowden's. Um, Bowden's do hostas ferns and they also bought out a, uh, a large bamboo specialist from Norfolk many years ago, but they do wonderful selections of things. Or if you want some really choice stuff, then Nick Mesa from Pan Global Plants is going to be your, your point of call for something really unusual. But of course, unusual does come with a price, but you, know, you, you might, you, you know, definitely worth going, definitely worth giving a go. And um, the last show and tell um, I've got um, is um, a lovely fern which is doing its thing at the moment, um, which is one of the heart's tongues. It's a splenium and it's a splenium um, scolopendrium. And you can see it's got these wonderful little tops to it, which I think are fantastic. And it's cristatum is the form of these. And I've got quite a lot of ferns in the garden and ivies and um, arums. because so I've got the whole sort of back section of my garden faces north. And it's a perfect spot to grow all these lovely things. And I buy all my ferns and ivies from Fibrex because they send them all out in little nine centimetre pots and you, you know, for what you pay for them, which is sort of 450 uh, for a nine centimetre pot, they're absolutely wonderful. They do a whole wonderful range. It's got its little spore sacks on the back, um, which are quite nice, but it's just the colour. My hope is doing it justice on here. That wonderful, I'll use that, use that, that wonderful sort of, sort of golden limey colour, which is that just lovely gorgeous. lime up the middle of the leaf is absolutely lovely. And on the tops of those crustate leaves at the top where the leaves um, divide at the top it's absolutely lovely lovely and I was thinking you know these planted with you, were, you know, we talked about arums earlier weren't we before we came on but planted with arums epimediums uh, cyclum and hedrofoliums um, you know you can even have some shrubby arboreal ivies running through as well and things all that wonderful texture and then pepper it with snowdrops as well I mean what an amazing mix of a foliage if you're very mild, you could use roscoes and gingers in there too for late summer colour. Because they love the shade, don't they? They really do. They do. So that, that would be, be fantastic. Um, the spl plain Asplenium scolopendrium is lovely. And there's also a really lovely one which is on my list, which is Asplenium scolopendrium um, angustifolium, which has a very, very tight leaf, which is rich, rich green, but it's really tight and it's ribbed all the way up and and curved and, and right to the tip. And that's absolutely lovely. And they're great ferns for shade, they're evergreens, but I do tend to cut all the fronds off them late winter, early spring, uh, just because after a few, if you leave them on for more than a year, they get a bit tatty. So just by cutting them off. So you're very, you're only without fronds for maybe sort of two months, which is, is not a long time at all. And during that time, you've got arums around them anyway, you've got epimediums coming through and other things. And then those croziers are nestling in the top and they come through as well. So. Clumps will get up to sort of 45 centimetres across when the leaves all come out and height wise about sort of 30 centimetres. But they're just lovely, I think, and fantastic foliage and texture for this year. Quite quirky. So Fibrex, great place to go for some interesting ferns. Yeah, they are and that's wonderful. my sort of show and tell for this time of year, really. I, mean, I did pick a few other evergreens and things, but I think we've done we've done it justice because you want to talk about some. Oh, have you Christmas got some ideas? Well, no, I've just, I've just got Picea pungens. Uh, which is growing in my dad's garden. It's a common old thing, Picea pungens, but it's lovely. Bought as a small tabletop Christmas tree 10 years ago, now at 20 feet in their front garden. But it's looking beautiful. Wonderful glaucous foliage, great needles, good form. Um, there's some good fastigiate forms of these as well, which will actually form lovely tight blue columns. Uh, there's a wonderful one called Brexit Blue. There's another one called uh, the Blues um, as well, which are lovely. There's a fantastic one called Edith, which has the brightest, lightest blue needles on it that have this bloom on them. Um, and many of these grow in um, the Thalictrum garden at yours, Al. Edith is up there. Yeah. And mm. she looks wonderful with a late flowering aster called Orpheus. And then oh. he's got a wonderful crop of um, Berberus round her, which goes sort of wonderful orange and scarlet in the autumn. And I think 
that glaucous blue with orange and scarlet is absolutely lovely. So yeah, that, that's quite nice. And um, oh, I just bought a Daphne as well. I think I've talked about it before, um, which is um, a Daphne called Mejima, which you don't see about that often, but I just got it from, I got it from B&Q about 10 years ago. Now, <laughs> I go to being, sorry, Brown. I go to B&Q a lot for clients to get sort of like supplies and things. And sometimes, you'll find really good stuff. One time I went in about five years ago, they had trays and trays of Daphne Jacqueline Postel, Daphne Spring Herald, and other um, good spring Daphnes, um, all reduced from 15 quid to three quid a pot. Oh, so wow. I bought the whole lot. I bought the whole lot. I bought. I, I think I bought 50 pots of of Daphne, because I will know. At three quid, Al, at three quid, Al, that's a bargain. You did what I like to call an Alan Gray. <laughs> When you I see the them, whole tray, <laughs> when you, I mean, it's very rare I like to do that. I, I don't often buy the whole tray, but it, it, I felt I felt decadent, almost luxurious in the process of doing it. And it was a lovely thing. So I thought people here aren't going to know what they're, they're going to know what they are. So I thought three quid. I'm having the lot. And uh, but Mejima uh, didn't come in that batch. But isn't she lovely? That uh, is wonderful. I'm, I'm, I don't know it at all. And I think it's absolutely fantastic. I'll tell you a little tip about B and Q. They generally have sell by dates on all their plants. <laughs> They and do. If go, yeah, if you go on the, on the day after, they are half price. I find that really odd that you'd put a sell by date on a flowering plant. But I suppose for them, they just want to get rid of it. Yeah. For but, any of our viewers in, you know, America, Australia, South America, wherever you might be in the world, India, um, where we have lovely pockets of viewers and listeners, hello. Um, <laughs> B&Q is like a yeah, sorry. DIY store that most of us go to to buy like paint, paint brushes, cement, gravel. But they do have a plant section, but it's not it's not kind of your top nursery level. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Occasionally, but occasionally it is obviously. Seemingly. <laughs> Look at me dragging the podcast down. It's a bit like the it's a bit like the Bunnings of the UK. Uh, <laughs> but you know, and also I found um, Alan grows a lovely variegated ligustrum. Uh, it's got I can't think of the name, but it's this wonderful, slightly scandon variegated ligustrum you've got in your front north garden, uh, mm. and and they've got batches of them in at the moment, and it's fantastic. And it's really a couple of years ago when Al got it, it's really unusual plant it still is really but to see it somewhere like that is is, is brilliant so you can, is you can get, uh, i think it's about sort of seven quid for a three litre pot but don't quote me on that but it's not bad at all but it might be the place to go to get it if you want to do a a river of them for example you know sort of running through your borders but it's a lovely yeah. small leaf ligustrum so good price good price and that's my show and tell of plants done so i was worried i wouldn't have enough but as usual <laughs> talk the hind leg off a donkey <laughs> And uh, I haven't got loads of stuff. So, yeah. Well, lots of inspiration. I clearly need to start going to B&Q on a kind of <laughs> weekly or fortnightly basis. It's not especially close to me, but I can I can make a beeline. <laughs> <laughs> now, I love all of that. And also, right at the very beginning, you min- mentioned plant heritage. And it's well worth, and I, I suppose it's probably UK only, but a lot of these, you know, Hardy Plant Society, Cottage Garden Farm, yeah. a lot of these groups... I remember with Jane Ann Walton, I've asked her before, oh, where did you get this wonderful plant? And, oh, it was a cottage garden seed swap or something. There are regular sales and seed swaps and things like that. So it's well worth joining up to these groups. Definitely. And the RHS, I know, I, I know Al gets a lot of seeds from the RHS um, seed exchange as well, don't you? You always often get a yeah. bit of interesting stuff from there. But Plant Heritage is great. And I give it a shout out because uh, locally in Norfolk, we have uh, two plant fairs through the year. Uh, we have 20 local nurseries that come and have stalls there, but also we have um, a display in the local village hall where we hold this. Where we have like a specialist nursery in someone like Edulis or Panache plants. Uh, one year, Alan put on a wonderful display. It was called the Spirit of East Ruston, and it was a, a good display of sort of terracotta pots, topiary, pelagoniums, vintage gardening tools. And we have people come in and do special displays in there of various things and we also have a members plant stall where the members have been growing and propagating and we have a little gazebo in the middle of the field and it's the members plant stall where you'll also find some real real interesting things that that people have been growing and it's so important we exchange these plants and what we're finding as well is the last few years we're getting so many young families and people in in their early 20s and beyond which we never had before who have got homes and want to have really good plants but also it's a great way of us preserving that genetic heritage of those plants and you know it's lovely that that all the gardening friends we talk about all grow these wonderful plants but also it's important that 
when people sort of get to a certain age in their gardening life, they think about propagating those plants and, and sharing them about. Otherwise, they're lost. I mean, I know, know with Alan, Alan's got a great gardening friend called Anne Borrell, who grows lots of snowdrops and things. I know that, that she often calls him over and says, well, you know, you must come and get some of this and get some of that, because she knows that she's a great gardener, but she needs to keep those interesting plants going and pass them on to good gardening friends is the way to do it. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also very reasonably priced often at these sales. Yes. Yeah. Not cheap. Going to do cheap, but no. do very reasonably, <laughs> reasonably priced. Yeah. I think, this, I think probably the most important thing of all, though, is the plant itself, because lots of these people, they're growing plants that are not hugely popular on the scale of one to ten. But if they don't grow them and, and share them, you know, we'll never we'll never be able to have them. Mm. And, and some of the plants can be quite genetically quite important or very important. Mm. So I think it is it's a lovely thing that people are are doing that. I got a very good clematis from Janet. Oh, um, Janet Sleep. Yes. Yeah. A very good clematis, which she dug up from her garden because it was too vigorous for where it was. Um, so, and I've never seen that, Clement. I can't remember the name of it now, but I, I've never seen it for sale anywhere. Put it that way. No, I, and I, I got some from her recently, which is a clematis just just called Ex Kurzgestan. So it was seed that she'd got from somebody and sown it in a wonderful sort of glaucous foliage, a bit like clematis orientalis, glaucous yeah. foliage. And then the flowers that come out are sort of a slightly chocolate colour, which sounds really odd, but it it works it works really well. And, and Janet Sleep, I talk about, is our chair of plant hedges, but she, she also grows unusual things and one thing she does grow is a lovely omphaloides spring flowering perennial called parisian skies i've never seen it anywhere but she's got it in her garden she grows it and occasionally she has it for sale and it's a lovely omphaloides which i think you'll find registered as, as scarce in the rhs plant finder so if she wasn't growing it, it wasn't selling it to people like herself and other people that, that buy it i've still got mine i can't remember but that's the important work that plant heritage does I don't know if you can buy memberships to things like this. We were wanting oh, to talk a little bit about Christmas, yeah. but if you wanted to gift somebody membership to a group like this, that might be quite an unusual, unexpected, but very lovely, thoughtful gift. I think it's a nice idea. And it's a great way of interacting with new gardeners. And I know sometimes the industry has a reputation for being sort of cliquey and, and elitist. And that is not the case, because all we want to do at Plant Heritage in particular, is we want to get new young gardeners in, new young people that have just got their own homes or got into gardening and, you know, to, to get them to not only buy plants, but just get them to learn about the experience of being in horticulture. I mean, I, I've done it for many years. Thordis, you you love it and, and, and came into it through a very different way. And then Alan's been gardening for a few more years than us. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to say for a damn long time. She might be offended, but, you know, for a few more years, haven't you, Alan? <laughs> yeah, I think I've been doing, I've, I've been doing it close on 70 years, I guess. Yeah, which is wonderful, you know, so... Once you get bitten by that bug, it's very difficult to get away from it. So, uh, yeah, but I think membership to, to Plant Heritage it is really good. The RHS as well, which is wonderful. Um, things like the Norfolk Gardens Trust locally we have, but they're around the country. If you like your history and want to learn about uh, properties, there are specialist groups like uh, Tapia. Is it Tapia, Sal? You're a member of, which is the Boxwood uh, Society? Taparius. Taparius, that's it. Yes, and that's the, the Boxwood Society. Uh, and they do lot, have wonderful talks and journals on different topiary and things like that. I mean, there are so many groups. Lots of these organisations are there to put you in touch with other mm. people and, and with things that you want to grow. Um, and thing, probably plants that maybe people find slightly obscure, mm. um, which is... I mean, I just find it so fascinating. I just love it. I yeah, think it's, I mean, it's, it's there's things like the Alpine Garden Society. There, there are loads of different groups. If you have got a particular interest, just look and there'll be a society for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think memberships as well, sort of to magazines and, and periodicals and things like that. I mean, I, I still, every year, I, I, I buy a subscription for my mum and dad for, for Garden News and Amateur Gardening, which are still fantastic magazines. You get them through weekly and they've got a garden feature in they've got top tips they've got a garden news section they've got plants and jobs and it's just brilliant and if you're new to gardening to get a little lovely sort of 20 30 page magazine through every week for is it is it something like two pound a week or something yeah. if that pound a week Al? yeah, yeah I, I love them yeah so yeah. some great christmas gift ideas for things like that you know subscriptions and memberships to various things and if you're worried that if you give someone a subscription to a magazine, they'll feel overwhelmed by it, you could go down the book route. I know that just before we started this podcast, uh, we were all running around assembling uh, various books that we love. Um, and you particularly wanted to sort of 
fly the flag of secondhand books, Ian, because you don't necessarily need to go down the new route. No, no, we, we should not not buy new books because that, that's lovely. And there are wonderful authors who are producing books all the time. I know you've had Naomi Slade on here before, who produces lots of gardening books on various subjects. And I know that you had, uh, did you have Philip Oostenbreek on here as well with his Jungle oh, we Garden got, well, as well? We haven't asked you yet, but the plan is oh, there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> given that way but you had jimmy jimmy blake on as well he's got a wonderful book out called a, um, a beautiful obsession is it oh yes. <laughs> oh my goodness i mean floral fomo is that garden i mean literally i just want i want it else i mean it's just you know, and they're great but there are some really wonderful secondhand books and i've had these books for a while uh, and they're ones that i wanted to pursue which are uh, roger phillips and martin ricks um, and i think al's got some of these as well i um, have they're a wonderful series of books. Uh, I bought them secondhand this year. Uh, they used to retail at 19.99, but I bought them online through eBay for all about £3.50, which I think is, is wonderful. And what I love about the, these books in particular is, is the content is absolutely wonderful in terms of plant descriptions, in terms of its botany and stuff. But also they have these wonderful plates. Oh. And you can see there that they've got a wonderful plate of status uh, and all the different cultivars and, and types of status you can grow this is his one also seen on annuals but all well described and with them being photographs as well it's great for identification and recognition and he's got a whole series of these annuals uh, there's ones on bulbs as well and, and the same things apply and with the bulbs as well which is brilliant look you get the whole bulb <sighs> And you get to see what the actual bulb is shaped like as well and what its scape is like, um, what the neck and what the base plates are like as well. And these are just, just a whole page of alliums. I mean, there are lots of good books, but I, would you agree, Al, these are great? I, I do agree with those, the, those um, the series of books by those people there. Was it Martin Ricks and... Roger Phillips one? and Martin Ricks. We sadly, lost, we sadly lost Roger Phillips a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and um, he died. But there was, a, um, there was a wonderful obituary to him on Last Word on Radio, Radio 4. Yeah. But he he they he left behind together with Martin Ricks the legacy of those books and mm. they're as relevant to, they are as relevant today as they were when we first bought them, which is probably I don't know twenty years ago when I first bought those I think. Yeah, I I, I would say that. So I think great to buy new ones, but there are some really good uh, secondhand books online that are worth buying. We always talk about Vita Sackville Wests, which are still worth a wonderful read. Uh, I know Al's been sort of uh, almost binging a bit on Christopher Lloyd stuff recently. You've been indulging because... yourself in that, haven't you? Well, I have because my two two books by Christopher Lloyd, The Well-Tempered Garden and The Adventurous Gardener, both of them are my gardening Bibles and they were getting so pulled about, if you like. I mean, <laughs> the spine was going and they were, you know, it's, it's not going to be too long before they disintegrate. And I said to Graham a few weeks ago, I said, can we get some more of them? And, and we went online and we found this. Oh, I've got um, that one. It's lovely. That I love that cover, don't you? Very the 70s. Garden. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the cover is very dated. But I mean, this book cost five pounds. Yeah. And the interesting thing is when it was published, it cost two pounds fifty. Oh, goodness. <laughs> but it was, you know, 40 years ago, whatever it is. And again, the the uh, the adventurous gardener here. Oh, um, yeah, lovely book. That one. Uh, again, that was five pounds. Um, so, you know, I think let me see when they were published, because it's quite interesting just to know that, isn't it, really? And the photographs were by a famous photographer of the time called Pamela Tola. Uh, oh. First published in 1983, um, which is quite some something, isn't it, really? And, you know, we sort of think perhaps 73, 83 was not that long ago, <clears throat> but the World Tempered Garden is even older. It's 1970. <laughs> I think, Al, we should say that, all, all, you know, although we, because we always talk about these sort of core group of garden writers, don't we? And that you can get your yep. gardening information from everywhere. But there's something about what these people produced and wrote and published that has stood the test of time. And every gardener should indulge themselves in it a bit because their writing, it, 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 it transponds through across those 40, 50 years. And it's all, you know, much of it, apart from a few plant cultivars that are different, mm -hmm. is all still very relevant now. And I think that's why we always go back to these core people. Were you listening to the audio version of the Christopher Lloyd books as well, Alan? I feel yes. like I, yeah, I feel like I heard you say that the other day. And yes, obviously yes. It's, it's sometimes hard to sit down and find time to read, but if you can put it on in the car or while you're pottering around in the garden. Well, it's so, it's so useful when I'm sort of up in the potting shed, you see. I mean, I've got radio in there and I can have whatever I, uh, I want on. But I mean, you know, when you're 
when you're gardening, you might as well be, be listening to a, a fellow gardener, mightn't you, you know, and, and learn something. Yeah. Um, and you always do. That's the amazing thing. You always learn something. There's something that, you know, a little nugget of information that you probably missed first, second, third time around reading it. But, you know, then again, you read it uh, or you hear it. I mean, and, you know, through the earphones and bang, it's yeah. in there. Yeah, I, I find it very hard to find time to read. Um, mm. So uh, this is my bedside reading. I absolutely, oh, that's too bright. I absolutely adore The Dear Friend and Gardener. Oh, if you it. want to get Christopher Lloyd and Beth Chatto in one place and all just the lovely intimacy of it, all of the little bits and bobs around the gardening about going to Blindbourne and picnicking and things like that. I absolutely love this book. It's such a tonic at the end of the day as you sort of have a quick few pages before bed. Though inevitably then you want to read more so you end up going to bed later. But <laughs> it's, I love this book. It's one of my absolute favourites. And of course they swapped lots of plants as well, Christopher Lloyd and Beth Tatter. They swapped lots of things, didn't they? So if it's not available from the Great Dixon Nurseries, it's probably available from Beth Chateau Gardens, uh, which, which is lovely. I just got a lovely cherry recently, actually, I've been after for a while, called Prunus Tinella Fire Hill, which is lovely. I've been looking for that for quite some time, and I'd seen it in Fergus Garrett's online webinars that he does. I'm a great one for watching those and been able to source it, and Great Dixter had sold out, but Beth Chateau Gardens had quite a lot of it. It's one of the lovely single flowering shrubby almonds, and it's a beautiful thing. Christopher Lloyd always says in his books, you know, it's a wonderful thing to grow, he said, but it can get quite scruffy, he said, but nothing that a good hard cut back after flowering when the sap is rising will not sort out. And I think that's very true. Yeah, you know, you take it in hand. And it flowers on those lovely new wands, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. yeah. It's, a bit, it's a bit like that Prunus triloba, but I don't like that because that has the really sort of double harsh pink ones, but Tinella yeah, Fire Hill is much more yeah. delicate and Get, get it in white as well, and then they're you know t if the weather's too wet, the those lovely little white double flowers go the horrible brown yeah, balls. Yeah, they just turn to mush, don't they? Yeah, not very nice at all. <laughs> so yeah. I'm quite impressed by your recent plant buying, Ian, because before we properly got on air, you alluded earlier that we've been talking about arums. I think you've had a little yeah, an awesome. arum splurge. I, I mean, in my head, I've got 20 acres. In real life, I've got <laughs> a very small back garden, but you know. And I think in my business as well, it's really important that I'm constantly buying and trying new things. And it does come at a price, but I think I've, I've got to keep growing stuff and trying things. And I'm a great one for, um, I, I grow lots of batches of plug plants as well uh, and various things and, and try them out and trial them and propagating and dividing. And it's really nice to be able to sell plants on that you grow yourself. I love that thing of, oh, well, for me, it does this. And I think that experience of growing something is great. But yeah, I bought some arums. Um, about uh, a couple of months ago, actually. And I know Alan was saying before, he's bought some lovely batches of arums just recently as well for their lovely silver scrolls and that wonderful chameleon-like foliage they have. Can either of you remember what arums you've got, by the way? Well, I've got one called Monk Silver. I do remember that. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's, that's um, a good one. Marmoratum as well, did you get on? Yes, I did. And I, uh, there's a... Um, there's a, a cream variegated one. There were, the thing was, I'll tell you what I did. I was looking at... I think he was in the English Garden or one of those periodicals. Um, and it was Joe talking about Arams. And, and I knew that he grew a lot of them. So I just sent him a text. Can I have three of each, please? Um, and so that's what he's brought me. Um, I've got several in the garden here anyway. I've got Miss Jan A. Hall, which is lovely yellow splashes on the leaves. And that is, that is at this time of the year. New leaves are coming up still. And I mean, it's this lovely marbled markings and all the rest of it. And I know... Some people think they're a nuisance and they go everywhere. As I had a um, photograph um, uh, and a letter come to the post the other day to somebody saying, I saw your article. I wrote an article about errands, you see. And they said, I saw your article about, about errands. But I can't see how you can recommend them to anyone because they just such, such a nuisance. They go everywhere, even outside our fence. <laughs> well, if you don't like them, dig them up. You know? <laughs> But I love sure. the idea that the plant's supposed to know where the fence is and not stray outside yeah. the boundary. <laughs> you will behave. <laughs> yeah. So naughty. It, you know, I mean, they've been, they're, they're a, a group of plants that they've got so much winter interest. And, you know, when we need that little extra pep and that little a bit, bit of extra pizzazz in the garden, I think it's lovely. You know, and they've been around for many years. Gertrude Jekyll, I mean, when she, she was Edwardian, um, and she used to pick the whole 
plant, rip it out from the ground, and it would come with the top plate of the, of the corn that's attached to it. All the leaves would be attached. You plonk them in a vase and stuck narcissi through them and, and daffodils and things like that. Well, I mean, you know. Very lovely. Yeah. Yeah, very beautiful. Wow. I look forward to seeing lots of photos from both of you of your wonderful arums in your garden. I mm. think mine will take a while to bulk up, I think. I mean, they're, they're, lo they're lovely plants uh, from Joe, really nice plants, but they are small pots. I think a lot of feeding and nurturing will bring them on, but they are gorgeous. They really are. Well, they were the right person. The yeah, exactly, doctor. exactly. <laughs> Did you have any other bits and bobs for gifting, Ian? Well, yeah, I was just, just going to say about a couple of good gifts, things gardeners shouldn't be without. Uh, and chopper roof is my sometimes my name, but um, a good pruning saw is something which I don't think any gardener should be without for a good Christmas gift. Uh, and we use these um, silkies, uh, so one called the Zubat, and they aren't they aren't the they aren't the cheapest by any means, but they are fantastic for taking either small limbs off trees or for stooling or for pollarding or for coppicing. They really are good. And the best thing about these sort of Grecian saws is that you can, because they've got that nice thin blade and end, you can get them in amongst the base of things. So I think that they're really good. And of course, now's the time you could be thinking about looking at your garden and maybe sort of crown raising things or through the winter months, you'll want to maybe coppice or pollard your willows or things which are really good. So a good saw to do it. And recently I got one of these ones, uh, a little, an Opinal who do actually wonderful French brand that do good cutting knives. They're also now doing a wonderful range of folding pruning saws, which are absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Um, and I've bought a couple of these recently for gifts for various people, but not a very long blade on there, uh, but absolutely brilliant. It folds up nicely. And what's also really good is they've got this little twisting barrel here, which if I twist it that way, it locks the blade in so it can't fold back down. And it's all very simple, but very good. Op and I'll do wonderful cutting knives. Uh, budding knives, um, tea budding knives for roses and things. But for a, a blade on here, it's called the number 12, this one. And for a pruning saw, which is going to be about sort of about 20 pounds. I mean, you'll get people that will get in touch and say, oh, but I always get mine from the pound section or this, that and the other. But I do think when it comes to tools and if you're using them every day like we are, it's worth paying a little bit more money on them. Um, and I think good sharp saws for pruning, definitely the way forward. So if you get a chance, have a look at Opinal. But Felco do great ones as well, um, as do um, Niwaki as well. They do great ones. But I think a great investment. And the other thing I bought the last few months was a good pair of secateurs, another oh. good pair. I've got a lot of secateurs. But these are, I mean, I have, these are Felco 13s. And the reason I got them is because they've got an extra wide. They're designed also to be used as small loppers. So if you struggle ergonomically with things, you don't want big loppers because of the weight or you can't, you know, they've got a good wide cut on them to get bigger branches. The 13s are designed to go around the branch and make sure you put the branch so it's deep in the back of the secateurs. That's really important. And you can then use both hands because it's wider with a longer handle to actually slice through those branches in one go. You can also do it like this with two hands that way because they're longer. You know, the, the, the ergonomicness of them and the work that really good. So these are excellent when I'm doing other pruning jobs. So I have these in my holster. I have a pruning saw on me. I also have a pair of Jacoti sheep shears as well, which are great for cutting back perennials. And in my pocket, I have a couple of knives, uh, a bit of string um, and a sharpening, small sharpening stone as well. So we carry a lot of kit with us. But, you know, you really need that stuff because during the day, I might be sort of running the sharpening stone over me secateurs a couple of times during the day. Um, but I think that's the basic kit for this time of year when you're pruning and cutting back and sorting. So just hope no really one nice gets kits. on your nerves. You're like a walking arsenal. And I have to remember <laughs> if I go to the garden centre after work, I have to remember to take everything off. Because otherwise I'm walking about with knives and saws attached to me, which I think is probably not the best thing to do. <laughs> no, I just thought they'd be quite good for gifts. So I don't know if any of you guys have got any other. Well, you know. the other thing about them being a bit more a bit more expensive some of us might struggle to spend the money on ourselves but if we're talking about gifts you don't want to go to a pound mm. store well you might but <laughs> depending on how much you like the person you might want to spend a bit more money or get them something that you know they might have wanted to buy themselves and they couldn't so I like the fact that you've brought along some of the, the sort of specialist stuff I think they're just well needed I think they're, they're, they're important things to have when you're out gardening this time of year and it's worth spending the money with the little things on them as well a little bit more money on things like that. Mm. Uh, apart from your winter garden Alan what are you dreaming of for Christmas what would be your your oh, top gift? Oh yeah that's a good one. Well I have I have on my wish list um, a new pair of boots 
I do Barry boots in that. <gasps> <laughs> um, so we'll we'll see whether Father Christmas obliges or not. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think he tends to forget people of my age. <laughs> no, he doesn't. What about plant wish list, Al? What would you what would oh. be in your plant wish list? So you you would really really want to get. Well, it just just shows you the power of advertising because I was looking through um, a gardening magazine and I saw um, a new Camellia japonica called Takanini, oh. and it was bred by Jury in, in New Zealand. And I think it was a seedling in 1984, which is quite a long time ago. But seed, uh, Camellia japonica Takanini is um, a double flowered, anemone scented, red flowered Camellia that starts flowering somewhere towards the end of November. Oh, and it lovely. goes right the way through until the end of March, beginning of April. And I tried to get it and everywhere is sold out. Oh no. So if you know anybody in that, right. and you know somebody that has camellias. I'm going to um, make a Tac note. Tacanini is the one. Tacanini, okay. Yeah. Jury, yeah. uh, I think it's Mark Jury who's done quite a lot of breeding with uh, magnolias and uh, exactly, yes. he's He's very good. And also I think, this sort of more early flowering process in the japonicas is coming through because there were some rogue seedlings appeared in some nurseries in California, which gave us Camellia cross vernalis, and there's one called Yuletide. And I think what they're doing is taking some of those genes and putting them into to get new japonica crosses, mm. which means and Yuletide flowers November onwards. So I think yeah. that might be what's going on there, which is really lovely. And they might even be putting a bit of Sasanqua in there as well to I sort think of they might, yeah. extend well, think that season. This is sort of kind of going with the flow of climate change, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, our winters may be milder and wetter um, and therefore allowing these blooms to, to, to show up, really, because if we have a very, very sharp frost on them, it'll kill the flowers because the flowers... Petals are quite fragile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, if they're blooming from November periodically through in stages, if we do have a sharp frost and the blooms get killed, there will be others when the weather turns warm again to take over. Mm. So all is not lost. Beautiful. Ian, what are you hankering after? What do you hope oh, Father Christmas brings to you? Well, there's an endless list plant-wise, to be <laughs> honest. Um, Tell me about it. No one can ask me this question because uh, there are just so many. <laughs> Well, yeah, I filled a couple of my sort of floral fomos. One was a lovely uh, Daphne called Mary Rose, which I've wanted for a while, which I managed to get a bit earlier in the year. And then I've been coveting Scheffleras for a while. Uh, and luckily someone has micro-propped Scheffler, Scheffler Taiwaniana, and it's about in all the garden centres and nurseries at the minute, so that's great. But there's a lovely Scheffler that Alan's got at East Ruston called Scheffleria Rodo rhododendrifolia I think it is which grows out and it's the most wonderful yeah. spectacular foliage and plant uh, so that's on my list to get from pan global plants when they have it and then also there's a wonderful fastidiae oak called curly head and that's been on a, a list for a while I don't think I'll get them now but they, they're always on a list and a lookout and any spare time I get I'm always trawling through the internet and looking back at nurseries and you know saying notify me when it's ready or let me know when you've got this. And it's a, a bit of a habit. That's for me. What about you, Thunder? Oh, there are so many things. I am excited because the plan is, the plan was to have done this already, but basically down the side of my house, I'm going to dig it up and I'm going to, at the moment, it's a bit of a dead space. I've been working on everything else, but I'm going to sort that out. Um, but I heard on the grapevine that somebody I know is getting rid of a raised bed. So I'm waiting on them giving me the the slightly nice. old timbers for that so that I can raise it up a little bit and uh, and hopefully improve the soil a little bit um so I'm excited and it's very shady so it's been lovely over the past few episodes that there's been a lot of talk about ferns and lots of shade lovers and things that I'm really coveting so I think they're all going to shoot to the top of my wish list so I can populate this new little bed down the side of the house oh fantastic and a few climbers on the wall maybe as well on the yeah, fence do you think on the fence yeah all all of that I I also have been instructed to move my um, my Salix um, Mount Aso, which is in, in the wrong place. So that's got to go there. That'd be fantastic. Not everybody wonderful. in the house likes where it is at the moment. No, well, uh, no. And as we know, if there's one gardener and one that's not so a gardener, it's always a series of great compromise. So the bed's being created mostly so I can move the willow, but you know, at least everyone's on the same page. It but, sounds yeah, great. A lot of my a lot of my wish list stuff for 
for probably just after Christmas is to do with that. But. So we've all got floral FOMO then. Oh, we've all, yes. Talking of which, shall we wind up with a spot of FOMO? If you've <laughs> never watched or listened to one of these before, we basically always like to share the things that we're hankering after, the plants that are giving us FOMO, because that's how we live our lives. Um, I have, as ever, been scouring lots of lovely Instagram accounts. There's a wonderful one, if you don't follow it, which I'm sure you guys do, the um, Arden Garden in Dublin. Oh, uh, yes. who, I know Jimmy Blake has recommended. So full of colour and inspiration all year round. Uh, wonderful Instagram page to follow. And the other day, they posted this wonderful Nephophia-like flower, and I'll say it wrong, um, Bulbine Corlessons. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. I said it right. But I, I just thought, oh, well, it was obviously orange. So I was immediately drawn to it. <laughs> but also it just, it, it had all that, you know, nephophia joy, but now. And so I thought, well, I, I, I'd rather like some of that in my life. What about you, Ian? Um, well, always a lot on the list, like I say, but particularly at the moment, I'm, I'm, I've got an, an angling to plant uh, a group of a lovely tulip, not tulip tree, a lovely um, liquid amber called Slender Silhouette, which I saw at Barcham's, a big commercial tree place a few years ago. And it forms this lovely, tight tower of of wonderful foliage and colour. So I've got an angling to plant maybe three of those together and then underplant them with maybe some lovely hummocky ginkgos and some wonderful sort of mound forming cryptomerias and things and just do a sort of little group of things like that maybe. Uh, something's sort of bubbling away in my brain and I'll probably do it on the field at mum and dad's which is why I sort of tend to plant stuff like that and just sort of see how it goes experiment with it but yeah I'd love to do that so that's what I'm going to look for throughout the winter months and see if I can get a group of those. Steve Edney big fan of that particular liquid oh is he yeah so if you go and check out check out the Steve Edney episode for for many plants but he did rave about a couple of different liquid ambers. I heard some of that one he was wild wasn't he with excitement. (laughs) Wonderful. We had a lot of fun. It was also the most Jinx podcast ever. We had so many different problems. You changed outfits. It was phenomenal. I mean, (laughs) how you guys did that. You could do that on stage. (laughs) Alan, what's your flow-mo this week? Well, can I have Ian's brain? (laughs) Oh, God, no, I don't know if you want that. Well, I want the plants out of it. I mean, I really do, because um, you you have a a fantastic knack of picking some, some really lovely plants. And I think that, you know, I suppose my flow mo is... My flomo is normally something to do with the time of year. Yeah, yeah. So I think you can safely say that my flomo is more winter interest, um, and scent is such a very important part of that. Um, there's a white Daphne that I want to get. Some of these Daphnes, they're not long lived, and and you know you, you might suddenly find they'll turn the toes up, <clears throat> which has just reminded me I've got a Daphne Balloo, a Jacqueline Postle that I must stake. It's near the garage, and I noticed that wind had been pushing it over a little bit. Well, they, they, don't like, they don't like that rocking, do they, Daphne? No, they don't. Yeah. No, they don't. So I must state that. But yeah, give me more Daphne. But Daphne Balua in every colour under the sun, oh. which is not much because it'll be for, for plummy colours. <laughs> <through the world. laughs> There's something about them, though, isn't there? They're, they're just so lovely. And, and now well, they're much they, more readily available. They never were, were they? They were so hard no, to get. Now they they're, 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 they weren't. You know, you used to be able to get them junkers. They used to propagate oh, them. Oh, yes. And, yeah. You know, there was always a waiting list. And then when you got, you got your plant, you paid a fortune for a twig. Albeit yeah. with roots on it, but you know it, it wasn't very big. Um, things have improved, I think. Our friend Richard was talking about a Daphne Missouri in one of the garden bushes called Bowles White. So that's also on my list as well. Oh I yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to try and get that because he always throws something in there, and and I, I know that if it's on the radio and, and Al's on there and he's, he's listening, we'll all be like, we want it. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's like that because oh, I just picked it up from someone in the great echelons of the gardening world you know that is but that's so true isn't that <laughs> that is so true about garden events don't you think yeah because you can go to garden events and and that daphne richard knows what it is he saw it yeah. probably it could be a plant heritage person yeah it's you very know, true very true kind of thing that's the kind of thing you get on their stalls it's, it's the rarities and the oddballs and you know mm-hmm. lovely things Excellent. that's what i love if you see richard richard hobbs are talking about at an event and he's walking away with some pots. The plants in them will look so inconspicuous. They're probably like tiny little things that he'll have got somewhere yes. that nobody else has noticed. But he's spied them and looked at the label and gone like, yes, I'm after that. I've lost the label, but this came from Richard years ago. It's really tight, fastidiate euonymus. And I can't think what on earth it is, but it's been in the garden 10 years. It's a, it's a metre and a half high and it's six inches across in width. 
but that came from Richard as a little twiggy thing. And I, I must find the name of it again because it's lovely. Uh, but it's, yeah, that's an obscure little thing. It was one single twig of green, <laughs> but I knew it was going to be something good because Richard was growing. And yeah. it must be. He doesn't, he doesn't grow any tat, that man. He really doesn't. Well, I tell you what, whenever he comes to a plant sale area um, or plant sales at anything, I mean, he, he comes to our snowdrop day. Um, the one thing that fascinates me about Richard and Sally's stand is that if you at the end of the day, there's very, very little left. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they have yeah. such interesting plants as the right prices, which is important, I think. Yeah, um, and, you know, they sell it. Yeah, sell okay. out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Witten Lane seeds, if people want oh, yes, to look up, yeah. look up his seeds. Right, if you can't get to a plant fair. We've mentioned lots of different nurseries and garden sets today as well, which is yeah, nice there's a people lot. to sort of go plant <laughs> shopping and present shopping, haven't they, which is good. Well, if people have some time off around Christmas, hopefully you'll have a little bit of time to yourself and you can start looking up some wonderful plants, maybe even treat yourself to some Christmas tools or something. Uh, lots of inspiration. Ian, it has been such a treat. We've been oh, trying to you pin too. you down to a date for a long time, but I'm kind of glad it ended up being our last one. Before well, Christmas. thanks for having me. It always makes me feel so welcome. It's lovely to be part of it every so often when I have time because uh, you two are doing great work I mean it's brilliant it's uh, a really cracking podcast to listen to so thanks very much well it's making us all poor but it's making us happier <laughs> <laughs> that brings great joy <laughs> have a merry Christmas everybody everybody on this yeah. podcast everyone who's been with us all year thank you so much and a very happy new year happy, happy Christmas gardening, everybody happy gardening bye, bye. bye. I've got it now, I've got it with me. I'll get it. I've got a small hang, so I'll only be a minute. <laughs> <laughs> hey ho. I've got a few bits of foliage and some berries and some... Oh, you've gone as well. Oh, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm just oh. a... For someone who... Oh, the light's just gone off. <laughs> In the darkness. Hang on. What's happened to your light? Alexa, office lamp 100%. Sorry. <laughs> I Good thought up. you had to put another shilling in the meter. <laughs> Pedal faster, Claire. Pedal faster. <laughs> <laughs> really sorry. Great for the blooper section, though.